in the book of uh, Luke. If you turn to Luke chapter 4, I would appreciate that. Luke chapter 4, we're continuing on in our series, Written So That You May Believe. Uh, it is a harmony of the Gospels. We're working our way through the Gospels. And, and believe it or not, we are on sermon number 25. If I've counted correctly, we are on sermon number 25 in this series, right? And I told you at the beginning of the series, there's probably going to be like 130 of them or so, so we got a while to go. It's going to be great. But sermon number 25, we've, we've looked at Jesus being born. We've looked at, even before he was born, that he has always eternally existed, right? And then he was born. Uh, he grew. We saw John the Baptist uh, pave the way for Jesus. And then Jesus came on the scene and he was baptized by John. The Spirit descended on him like a dove. Uh, and, and God confirmed, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, right? We saw this, this amazing confirmation of God, God's ministry through Christ. The Messiah was on scene, and then he begins his miracle, miracles and his work and his preaching and his teaching. We see the miracle at Cana. We see him uh, go into Jerusalem. We see him drive out uh, the tax collectors from, from inside the temple, right, or inside the, the sanctuary. And, and, and this is Jesus' work. And he's starting to make people a little angry. He's starting to make people feel real, really good in some cases. But then, then uh, a teacher of the law, we saw Nicodemus came and talked to him. And he talked about what it means to be born again. Right, speaking in with terms of authority, speaking of terms of, of you, you need me, I'm the one who you're born again through. And then we met, met and saw the scene of the woman at the well, where Jesus uh, talked to a Samaritan woman who, who was totally sinful and shameful past, and, and he reached uh, into her heart, right, and, and, and cleansed her through faith in him. He, he revealed to her that he was the Messiah indeed, and then she spread that word throughout her town, and people came to faith in Christ. Uh, and we see the story continues on now uh, as we see Jesus continue to perform miracles. And then he comes to his home region, right? And we saw last, last week he was kind of in Galilee. And, uh, and he was in, that, in his home region. People were a little bit welcoming, but they were also unwelcoming, right? Remember that? We saw that. We, we started to see that they really wanted him to do signs and wonders and miracles. Like, hey, we, let's, see your, let's see your power. Wave your magic wand. And I, I talked about the fact that really what they wanted was a circus sideshow, right? And, and this week, we, we kind of come out of that uh, unwelcoming welcome to see uh, more specifically in Nazareth, right? Not only just in Galilee, but in Nazareth. This is his hometown, and what we're going to see in his hometown is, is similar. Uh, it's an unwelcoming welcome, but I, I've titled today's message a love-hate reception. It's a love-hate reception. So we're going to look at what that, what that story looks like and how it unfolds in Luke chapter 4. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll read the text, and we'll get going, okay? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity you've given us to look to your word and, God, to be transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, as we look to this, this account in the gospel, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see not only what was happening then, but what is happening in our own hearts. God, our, our hearts are constantly in flux. Our motives seem to change and sway a lot. So help us to, to look introspectively at our own heart, to examine it and to, to be found in a place of humble faith in you and faithfulness to you. God, as we look to your text, open our hearts and minds. Convict us of sin, and God, drive us to our knees to a place of repentant faith in you. We trust you. We thank you. We give you all the praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're in Luke chapter 4. We're going to read verses 14 through 30, and we'll cover that today. Uh, this first couple of verses kind of gives us what we talked about last week as well. Uh, Jesus returned to Galilee in the, spirit of, uh, in the power of the Spirit, uh, as, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues, being praised by everyone. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given, it, given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He has uh, to set the, free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone on the, in the synagogue were, on, were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. They were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came out of his mouth. Yet they said, Isn't this the son of Joseph? Then he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Doctor, heal yourself. 
what we've heard, uh, what we've heard that you took pl- that, that took place in Capernaum, uh, do here in your hometown also. He also said, "Truly, I tell you, no prophecy is accepted. Uh, prophet is accepted in his own, in his hometown. But I say to you, uh, there were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's day." When the sky was shut up for three years and six months, while a great famine came over all the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them except the widow of Zephar uh, in Sidon. And in the prophet Elisha's time, there were many in Israel who had leprosy, and yet not one of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They got up, drove him out of town, and brought him to the edge of a hill in, uh, in hill that their town was built on, intending to hurl him over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd, and he went on his way. Pretty interesting story, isn't it? Interesting account of what happened to Jesus. So we're going to look at this uh, this love hate reception that is happening here in Nazareth, and, uh, and, and we'll break down this text. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing account, and I, I think Jesus really had a heart for his own hometown. He, he did that, and we talked about last, uh, I think last week, the idea that sometimes it's just too close, right? It's like the Jason Seahorn thing in Mount Shasta. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, we, Jason Seahorn, oh yeah. He's, we almost say, we see him on TV, he's like, oh yeah, he's, he's my buddy, and we don't really know him, right? We know he's from this area, he's from here, but you may not even know him, but, but there's something like, we elevate ourselves, right? He's still amazing. He's a superstar. He's a, a pro athlete. But we, we elevate ourselves, so there's not really, and in elevating ourselves, we kind of lessen him because we're not, we're not really his homeboy. We're not really, I mean, some, someone probably is, but not me. And we do that with Jesus here. We see Jesus going back to his hometown. It's like, oh, okay, he's our hometown boy. We know him. And, and he kind of, it's almost that proud thing. I remember this even, uh, even in, in Montana when I was able to, to give a testimony and give a, like a sermon, sermonette at my home church, right? It was almost like they were just, everyone was just so proud, so proud of our youth. They're doing such a great job. And, and look how, but it's weird because they didn't really listen to the content much, right? It, there's something about the content, the gospel's being taught. But it was just, oh, we're just so proud of our hometown kids, Right? And, and it, it's like a badge of honor. And so you have to kind of get out of that. People say that we, the only, only expert we can ever find is someone from out of town, right? Because we, we don't really trust each other. It's like, oh, I know that person. They're, they're funny. I've seen them when they had a zit on their face or whatever. You know, what it, that's what we do. So Jesus is getting that reception there as well. And, and it's this love-hate reception. So let's look at this. In this love-hate re- reception, number one, we see this. This is the first part of the story. He gave them his message. So there's a lot of he's in this and a lot of they's in this you're going to see. He gave them his message. Let's look at Luke 14, uh, thir- uh, 4, 14 through 30. I'm sorry, not 30. Uh, the first part through 21. Uh, then Jesus returned to Galilee, right, in the, in, in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues, being praised by everyone. Now, there's a, there's a moment here because we know that he came full of grace and truth. So there's a lot of graciousness there. He didn't just get up and say, you're all going to hell in a handbasket. He wasn't, he, he wasn't this, this hellfire and brimstone. He was like, listen, I want to give you grace and compassion. I am grace and compassion. I'm full of grace and full of grace. And I'm, I'm the way and we can, let's go together. And people are, oh yeah, this is really great. The problem is he didn't just come in grace. He also came in what? Truth. And he was a perfect mixture full of both. Right, so, so we'll see that today. They, they were amazed. They, they loved what he was saying. They, they, they were, he was being praised by everyone. Oh, he's saying some great things. Amazing. Look, look how far he's come. Look how he's grown up. He's such a good boy. He goes on. He came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue. As usual. What does that mean? Jesus made it a habit to worship God in the congregation with the congregation. It's probably important for us as well. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. Now, this is probably, in, in, the, in the synagogue, there's a whole, there's a lot of text about what was happening during these services, and you can kind of see and study that on your own. But he was likely asked by the attendant to say, hey, would you, you're going to give the, the, the prophetic book reading, right? There was a, the Torah was read, and then the, then the prophetic book was read, and, and then after the prophetic book was read, that person gave a sermon. So his turn this week was to read the prophetic book of Isaiah, and he chose that text, and, and then to give a sermon. So he, uh, the scroll was given to him, and he, he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written. This is Isaiah 61, by the way. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim release of the captives, to recover the sight of the blind, and to free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he stops there. Now he kind of skipped a couple things, and he, he omitted a ver- the, 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 next, the next line he omitted, right? And basically it was to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and, and judgment of God, that God's judgment is coming. Right, well, Jesus said, yeah, that, that's there, but I'm not, it's not right now. I'm right now. This is the year of the, Lord, the Lord's favor. So it says, then he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. Now, in those days, sitting, the preacher would sit down. There wasn't a big, huge pulpit, and they stood, and rah, 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 you know, they sat down. And it was almost more like, you need to listen. You need to listen here. Right? It was almost like, I have authority, of course, standing, but when I sit and I'm quiet, you're like, what's going on? Right? You're, where did he go? And you, you, all the eyes, all eyes were fixed on him. Like, what's he going to say? What's, what is he going to say about what he just read? I want to know. He began by saying to them, right, all the eyes were fixed on him. Uh, he began by saying to them, today as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. And they're like, what, what's he, oh, what's he, what are you talking about? He's talking about, how? Is it is because it of all these miracles that you're doing, it's kind of the year of the Lord's favor? That's, that's neat, okay, Right, and so through this reading and his sermon here, we, we see him saying two things. There's two things that he's saying. He, first, the redemption of Israel that was promised long ago in Isaiah found its ultimate expression right here, right now, through him. Jesus was on the scene. Israel's, Israel's redemption and the world's was at hand. He was the fulfillment of that. The second thing that we see him say is, is really what he didn't say. What did he say? He left out the judgment of God. Now, this is going to irk some people because, like I said earlier, we come in and we kind of like, we got to do our show, we got to put on our nice clothes, and we're going to go to church today. And it's almost a self righteousness that can, we can get into. Like, I'm, I'm good, I'm good enough. I, if I go there, I've, I've, I've paid my dues. And that's what they did because when they came, they said, I, I'm, just, I'm just being my own self righteous way, and I'm expecting that eventually God is going to judge the enemies, our enemies, right? And we're going to be able to be even more free and more blessed than we ever have been because we're self-righteous. They didn't think that they were poor in spirit at all. They didn't think that they were bound by sin. They didn't think they were blind and living in darkness. They felt that they were righteous. But he left this out. He left this judgment out. And it's going to irk them because they want their enemies destroyed and they want to be elevated. So the second thing is what, it, what he says is what he didn't say. That there would be a day of God's vengeance, but it was not being fulfilled that day. This was the year of the Lord's favor. This was when God, as man, came to earth to free us. Now let's work through what he said in this quote. Because he's talking about spiritual. I, certainly he healed actual blind people and cured leprosy, and he, he took care of people who were maybe poor, and he made sure they had food, right? He, this happened. But he, what he's talking about is the spiritual bankruptcy inside of the heart. So he's, he's um, to preach the good news to the poor. These are the, the, the moral and spiritually poor, right? There's moral and spiritual poverty. I'm just, I'm just bankrupt. I, I've got nothing. And, and, and moreover, it's those who are poor are those who are aware of it. Everyone, right? Everyone fits that category that we're morally and spiritually bankrupt. But most people say, oh, I, but I'm good enough. It's okay. I'm not as bad as that person. But the people that are aware of it are the ones that need it, right? The ones that, that want it. He says, then I'm going to proclaim the release to the captives. Well, what kind of captives? This word captives meant prisoners of war. They were bound by something. They were spiritually bound by shame, by money, by guilt, by sex, by hatred, by bitterness, etc. On and on, they were bound in sin, not free at all. And he wanted to recover the sight to the blind. Some of those who were living in darkness, they couldn't see their way out. They couldn't see the light at all. And Christ would bring light because he is light. And to free the oppressed. The oppressed, it's, it's different than captives, right? Captives are bound to sin. The oppressed are those like crushed. They're the ones that are shattered or broken and they're squashed by life's circumstances and they feel like there's no way out. Listen, if you fit into any of those categories, I don't want you to feel humiliated. I want you to understand that's where Christ wants you. He wants you to understand how bankrupt you are. He wants me to understand how bankrupt I am without him. 
how poor I am, how blind I am, how imp imprisoned I am, how crushed and oppressed and squashed by life I really am. If you don't feel that, that's the same way this, this crowd was feeling inside the synagogue. Like, that's not me. What's he talking about? Go crush my enemy. Acts 26, 16 to 18. The charge was given. Get up and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them. To what? Open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God and that they might receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is the gospel, folks. The message that Jesus preached in Nazareth was the gospel. And he was there as the fulfillment of it, saying, this is me, I'm the one you need. But you must become spiritually poor, bankrupt, blind, a captive, and understand how, how crushed you really are and oppressed you really are. But they didn't really quite get that. They, they weren't liking that. So let's move on. What, what, what else happens in this love-hate reception? So he gave them his message, and then the next thing is that they were amazed. Number two, they were amazed because he had gracious words. They were amazed, but he rebuked them. He rebuked them. Let's go on in the text. Verse, verse 22. They were all speaking well of him. Like, oh, it's, it's one of those hometown boys. Good job. We're so proud of you, sonny boy. Way to go, Joseph's son. Joseph, you know, he would be proud. They were, they were amazed. They were speaking well of him. They were amazed by his gracious words that came out of his mouth. But they kind of avoided the truth he was speaking. Because they said, oh, when it came to truth, this is just Joseph's son. Right? That's what he said. This is Joseph's son. Then he said to them. So he knows their heart. He's still in his chair. He's still ready to preach. He knows their heart. He says to them, no doubt you'll quote to me this proverb. No doubt this is what you're thinking. What did he say? So no doubt, this is the uh, doctor, heal yourself. Right? What we've heard that took place in Capernaum, do here in your hometown also. Here's what, here's what they know. Just like last time we, we talked about this in Galilee, they want his miracles. They want the blessing of knowing Jesus. They want the miracles associated with Jesus. But Jesus, don't, don't tell me about sin and, and my problems. We're all good here. Go, go, to, go somewhere else. Which is interesting because he does, right? They continually reject and not receive him. But he, he calls them out on it. You, you want me to do in my hometown what I've done other places, Dr. Heal yourself. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But I say to you, there were certainly many widows in Israel in, in Elijah's day when the sky was shut up for three, uh, three years and six months and while there was great famine over the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them except the widow at Zarephath uh, in Sidon. So, so you think about this, like he's saying it's, it's, it's true, you, you want all these miracles, but even in Elijah's day, the prophet, it, it never happened for all of the widows there. Even in Elisha's day, it didn't happen, in, in, leprosy wasn't cured all around, it, it is what he goes on to say here, right? And in the prophet Elijah's time, where there were many in Israel who had leprosy, and yet none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. See, they wanted, they wanted this proof. They wanted to see these miracles. They wanted blessing. They wanted favor. This is where Israel's at. This is the year of Jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor. Of course, they wanted favor. Bring, the, bring on the blessings then, Lord. But the blessing was not, the, the miracle and the blessing was not what they had thought it was. It was something different. See, Jesus goes on here, but he's basically rebuking them, right? He's questioning their acceptance of him. And he said to, them, said to them exactly what they were thinking. I said, I know your heart. I know what you're thinking. And, and while it seemed in their heart like they still lacked objective evidence, Jesus knew better. He, he knew that they had all the evidence they needed. They knew who he was. They had heard what he'd done. He's there preaching him himself. They, but him there was not good enough. How many times has that resonated for us? That Jesus right there present isn't good enough. Remember we talked about that the other day. They wanted to see a miracle, but they were eyeball to eyeball with the Savior right then. And they still needed to see a miracle. No, the miracle is right in front of you. Jesus is there. He knew better. And he went right to the heart of the matter, which was their spiritual 
self-sufficiency and their pride. He was calling them out. He said basically, you need to become poor. You need to become imprisoned. You need to become oppressed and blind. You need to know how, how, how far off you are, how bankrupt you really are. I want to read a couple of these accounts that he, he mentions here. He, so Jesus is quoting this account from 1 Kings chapter 17, uh, the story of Elijah and the widow. The word of the Lord came to him, uh, get up and go to Zarephath uh, and, that belongs to Sidon and go and stay there. He says, look, I've commanded a woman who is a widow to provide for you there. So Elijah got up and went, went to Zarephath. When he arrived at the city gate, there was a widow gathering wood. And Elijah called out to her and said, please bring me a little water and a cup and let me drink. And she went to get it, and as she did, he called to her and said, please bring me a piece of bread uh, in your hand. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I don't have anything baked. You, you, you see the content, as the Lord your God lives. Right? It's kind of not personal yet, right? But she's, she's obeying. As the Lord your God lives, I don't have anything baked. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a bit of oil in a jug. And just now, I'm gathering a couple of sticks in order to prepare it for myself and my son. Like, I'm going to finish off the biscuits and so we can eat it and we can die. That's what she says to him. Right? There, it's dire straits for her. Do you think she understands how bankrupt she is right now? Yeah. There's nothing in the bank. There's, there's no food left. She understands exactly where she's at. It takes that to really have come to faith if we aren't spiritually bankrupt what we want is a sign i want to see this wondrous thing give me more favor give me more blessing but when we become spiritually bankrupt and and humiliated that's when we can understand how poor in spirit we are and how much we need jesus so then elijah said to her don't be afraid go and do as i have said but first make me a small loaf from it and bring it out to me afterwards you may take some for yourself and your son so bring it to me first and then we'll see what happens right for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The flour jar will not become empty and the oil jug will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the surface of the land. There was a famine, a drought, three and a half years. This is going to be, right? This is long. There's a pr promise there, isn't there? So she, she could say, now wait a minute, no, show me. I want to see a miracle. Fill these jugs up right now. Then we'll, then we'll bake all the bread you want. That's kind of logical, isn't it? Why don't you fill this first and then we'll... We'll bake bread. No, no, go. go. And what, what's he asking of her? He's saying, go in what? Faith. Go in faith. So, in verse 15, she proceeded to do according to the word of Elijah. She went in faith. She did it. She didn't have to see a miracle. She had the promise of God. She could either believe it or she could reject it. I'm sure it was a love-hate moment for her. I love that I could, you know, maybe have more food and be provided for, but I hate the fact that I, I don't know that this is going to happen, and I might waste it all on this weird-looking guy. But she proceeded to do it anyway. Then the woman, Elijah, and her household ate for many days. The flour jar did not become empty, and the oil jug did not run dry, according to the word of the Lord he had spoken through Elijah. You take him for who he is. You take, you, when you're spiritually poor and bankrupt and humiliated, you, can, you have really nowhere else to go but to trust him in faith. Jesus was saying, listen, I want your heart and I want your faith. Then I will give you real favor. favor. Then I will give you real freedom. Same is true in the account of, of Naaman when he goes, it's man with leprosy. Now, he, he, had, he has leprosy and then they heard, oh, Elisha, he's doing amazing things. Let's, let's go to him. So they sent people over, said, hey, I've got a guy with leprosy. What do we do? Bring him on down. Hey, have him cleanse in the Jordan three you know, or seven times, I think it was. Go in and out seven times. He'll be clean. The word gets back to him. He's like, what are you talking about? I've got better, cleaner rivers right here. I, I want some kind of magic spell. Basically saying, I want some great miracle, make a great awe-inspiring thing. And, and here's where we pick up in 2 Kings 5. If his servants approached him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? What are they asking, right? If, if, if the, they would have said, do some miraculous, amazing fire dance, rain dance, magic wand, and you'd be like, oh, that's got to be the ticket. It's, it's huge. It's got to be the ticket. You would have done it. So this is, what they, this is a question for us now, not just him, for us. How much more then 
How much more should you do it when he only tells you, wash and be clean? It's like, that's all I got to do? That's all there is to this? Yeah, that's it, because it's called faith. And in order to get to a place of faith, we have to have been humiliated. So Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, according to the command of the man of God. Then his skin was restored and became like the skin of a small boy, and he was clean. I'd say, let's go to the Jordan, right? <laughs> Take a dip. But it wasn't the Jordan, it wasn't a different river, it was his faith that did it. So here's the question we have to ask ourselves. You see, there's this po- point, Jesus wants us to get to this point of spiritual bankruptcy and, and poor in spirit, but we have a lot of pride inside of us, don't we? Self-righteousness. So the question is this, same question towards Naaman. Why not do the humiliating thing and be cured? Why not humble yourself? Why not say, you know what, I don't have it all together. You know what, I am asking for this huge favor from God based on nothing of my own. Yes, I am asking to see some miracle instead of just trusting in who he is. Why not do the humiliating thing and be cured Why not see him for who he is? Why not repent and turn to him in faith? Why not do that? Now, this is what what they're hearing from him. This is what this crowd in Nazareth is hearing from him. Like, are you kidding me? You want us to humble ourselves? Do you not know who's on the other side of the gate? Do you not know who's down the road in that city? Do you not know the oppression that we face from our government? Do you not understand? And what's happening? He's saying, you need to repent. You need to humble yourself. And they're saying, no way, Jose. And what happened? Anger boiled up. So you have this love-hate reception. And number three, they became enraged and they cast him out. They became enraged and they cast him out. Right? He came to give gave them his message. Right? And then they, they wondered and were amazed at that, but then he, he rebuked that because he knew their heart. And now they became enraged. They were angry. They were mad that they, that, that they were being told that they were wrong. Look at Luke, or Luke 4, 28. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. I, I skipped over that the first time I read it. Who, who was enraged here? Everybody. Everyone there. And listen, it's, it's homeboy back in town. Everybody's there. Everyone was enraged. Everyone's heart was that way. Everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They got up. They drove him out of town and brought him to the edge of the hill that their town was built on intending to hurl him off the cliff. Their amazement was turned to hate. Right When when Jesus put the spotlight right on their own hearts and made them examine it. So we don't like that. We don't want to be examined. We don't want to have anybody see what's going on here. We don't want to be exposed in any way. But Christ turned the spotlight right there. And his words of graciousness, saying things like, I'm the way, became words that enraged them because he said, I'm also the truth. You see, he is the way, but he's also the truth. And in him and in his truth is where we find life, not somewhere else. People were, were resenting Jesus. They were resenting his, his assertion that, that salvation is only available to those who acknowledge themselves to be poor or prisoners, or blind, or the oppressed. Listen, they were not about to accept those labels on themselves. Like, no, no, we're better than that. And Jesus is like, huh, I, can't, I can't, yeah, I guess you are. You're better than that. They viewed themselves as self-righteous, and they wanted Jesus to bless them and squash their enemies. Right? It's amazing how angry they became, how enraged, how, how their hearts were hardened. But isn't this like all of us? Listen, what, we love the truth when it enlightens us. It's like, oh, that was great. Good knowledge. I re- we love the truth when it enlightens us. But we hate the truth when it accuses us. It's a love-hate reception, isn't it? We love the truth when it enlightens us, but we hate the truth when it accuses us. Let us not be a people who only want gracious words, right, and are not willing to come to the truth. We don't want to be that kind of people. I want to read a, a story to you real quick, and then we'll, we'll finish up with our last point. And I want you to understand this miracle that's happened here. See, they, they're, they're looking for a miracle, right? And there's two, we're going to see two in particular today. 
One is this, that Jesus himself is among them. And Jesus himself is the, is the fulfillment of the one who can give them favor and give them blessing through repentant faith in him. All it takes is humbling themselves, being humiliated because they're poor and they're blind and they're oppressed and they're crushed, and to come to faith in him. That's a miracle, that he's there to set them free. He's there to bring them into light. That's a miracle. And he's right there in their midst. We'll see the second one in a minute. This is a story that came out of one of the commentaries by Kent Hughes that I was reading. A large, prestigious British church had three mission churches under its care. And on the first Sunday of each new year, all the members in the mission churches would come together for a combined communion service. In those mission churches, located in the slums of a major city, uh, there were some outstanding cases of conversion. right? Thieves, burglars, and, and others, notorious people. But all knelt as brothers and sisters side by side at the communion rail. They, that when they, they had come to Christ, they were all brothers and sisters. On one such occasion, the pastor saw a former burglar kneeling beside a judge of the Supreme Court of England. The very judge who, sat, or who had sent him to jail where he had served seven years. And after his release, this burglar had been converted and become a Christian worker. After the service, the judge was walking out with the pastor and said to him, did you notice who was kneeling beside me at the communion rail this morning? The two walked along in silence for a few more moments, and then the judge said, what a miracle of grace. What a miracle of grace. The pastor nodded in agreement. A marvelous miracle of, of grace indeed. The judge then inquired, but to whom do you refer, pastor? Well, the former convict, the pastor answered. The judge said, I, I was not referring to him. I was thinking of myself. The minister, surprised, replied, you were thinking of yourself? I, I don't understand. You see, the judge went on, it is not surprising that the burglar received God's grace when he left jail. He had nothing but his history of crime behind him. And when he understood Jesus could be his Savior, he knew there was salvation and hope and joy for him. And he knew how much he needed that help but look at me. I was taught from the earliest infancy to live as a gentleman, that my word was to be my bond, that I was to say my prayers, to go to church, to take communion, and so on. I went to Oxford, obtained my degrees. I was called to the bar and eventually became a judge. I was sure I was all I needed to be, though in fact I too was a sinner. Pastor, it was God's grace that drew me in. It was God's grace that opened my heart to receive Christ. I am the greater miracle. It's, it, it's why it's so hard for a rich man to come into the kingdom of God. Because it takes humiliating repentance. It takes understanding that as rich as you might be, you are poor. As much favor as you might have in your life and see in your life, you are still blind. Right, as, as well off as you might be in status with relationships of people, you are still oppressed and bound by sin. And we all need Jesus. The greatest miracle is the one who comes to Christ never thinking they ever needed Christ. The poor, the blind, the oppressed know they have a need for hope. You and I, who maybe aren't in that place, it's even more difficult. And, and that's where the synagogue was that day. They were self-righteous so the miracle was Jesus was right there. Finally, this love-hate reception, they, they became enraged, right? They wanted to cast him out. And number four, finally, he was not hindered. He was not hindered. It says in Luke 4.30, that they're right on the edge of the cliff, they want to hurl him over, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. What is that called? What were they looking for? A miracle? What was that called? A miracle? Did they see it? The miracle of Christ as a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy is right in front of their face. And they wanted something else. So they took him to the edge and to throw him off a cliff. And the miracle of Christ passed right through the crowd unhindered. And they didn't even realize it was a miracle. It's amazing though, even when we intend to cast him out, what the promise of the gospel means for us. John 6, 35. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. 
No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. But everyone the Father gives me will come to me. Now listen, everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. What a great promise we have in Christ that he will never cast out those who come to him in faith. When we repent of our sin, when we, when we humble ourselves, when we even dare to say it, become humiliated because of how bankrupt and spiritually poor we are, when we come to faith in Christ, his favor does rest upon us. The miracle does happen in our heart. He forgives us of our sin and we are cleansed. He is the fulfillment of the year of the, Lord, uh, the Lord's favor. He is the fulfillment of what we need as an atonement for our sin. And he says that if we come to him, although we may have been casting him out and casting him out, once we come to him, he will never cast us out. This is the gospel. This is the beauty of the gospel. And listen, our theme, these are written as we, as we go through this and discuss this and, and, and think about this and hear this. These are written so that we may believe that he is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And that by believing, we might have life in his name. Amen? Let's stand together and pray and continue in worship. Father, we, we love you so much and we are thankful for your word. And God, God, help us to humble our hearts. Man, it's so hard sometimes for us to see you're right in front of us. You're, you, the favor of God was given to us through Jesus. God, help us to see him for who he really is. Not for what we want him to be, not for what we want him to do for us but for who he, who he really is, the Messiah, the one that has come to, to show us how spiritually bankrupt we are. God, to show us how poor in spirit we are. God, to show us how blind we are and how oppressed but we are. God, how, how imprisoned we are to sin. And God, that when we understand and realize that, that we would humble ourselves like Naaman and just do the simple thing and repent and, be, and believe and be cleansed. And God, we... We repent of casting you out. There's so many times in our own self-righteousness we have thrown you aside. We wanted to hurl you off a cliff. And God, time after time, you come back to us, offering us your forgiveness. God, help us realize and understand that when we come to faith in Christ, when we believe, we are forgiven and atoned for and you will never cast us out. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.